quite the view, eh? Well, at least it's quite the view for me. The camera never does quite do things justice. But there's a pond amongst all this foliage, and I say this because of these yellow flowers. Iris pseudocorus, otherwise known as yellow flags. They are wetland dwellers. Well, that elder tree is highly inaccessible. Or should I say, that Sambucus tree? If you want to know the genus. Did you know? You know the drink Sambuca? It contains, or at least it used to contain, elderflower from the Sambucus tree. Makes sense, right? But that's up for debate. It might be something to do with the Arabic name for the spice, anise. But anyway, ask by me some brackets. Give me the brackets. I want the brackets. There's so much blushing bracket in this woodland. You literally can't walk more than 100 meters in any direction without stumbling across a huge batch of it. Well, what have we got here then? Right off the bat, an on-the-fly identifier would suggest it's one of either three things. One, a puffball. Two, an amanita, maybe an amanita phylloidus, otherwise known as the death cat. How intimidating. Still growing in its universal veil, not yet emerged. But probably not. Or three, a harmless stink horn. But as the lovely Maddie correctly pointed out, there is a bit of a gelatinous protrusion from its veil. So one would immediately assume that it's a stink horn. But there's only one way to find out for certain though. Cut it open. Get on that dissection game. Who's that cutting a grape? Wow. Ah, it's like an eyeball. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. What is it? That's a phallus impudicus, my dear. Oh, hang on. I should talk to the camera. <clears throat> this is indeed a stink horn. The common stink horn, phallus impudicus. I've cut it open the wrong way, though, but gonna whack up an image of what it looks like once it's fully developed. Indeed. But there is a reason why it's called the stink horn. The greeny part what is what's mean? known as the gleba, if you want to get technical, is what carries the spores of the fungus, and is what stinks. The greeny part is what becomes the head, or the bell end, of the fungus, so to speak, once it's emerged from its little veil. And as the common name would suggest, it does indeed stink. Like, on a level you can smell it before you can see it in most cases. It really is quite offensively pungent. Describe the smell. Well, it's a mixture of hydrogen sulfide and methanethiol, which has a sulfur group in its molecular structure. So, you know, sulfur, that rotten egg smell, decaying swamp smell, or singed hair smell. But it contains the spores of the fungus, and the reason why it smells is because it emits a ton of pheromones that attracts insects. So, insects are the vector for spore dispersal with this fungus. The smell only really develops as the fungus develops, though. In this premature egg stage, it doesn't really smell at all. Here's another one, just starting to emerge. A much better specimen for a bit of dissection. It only takes two to three days for them to fully mature, but for the sake of demonstration, and the fact that it's just so enticingly disgusting to look at, let's get inside this bad boy. I'll cut this one open properly this time though. Handling one, it feels much like a testicle. No homo though. Or a grape, you know, that might have been a better thing to say. There we go! So pretty. But you can see it has started to take shape. But this little white section, what's known as the receptaculum, is what eventually becomes the stalk of the fungus. And is edible. It tastes just like horseradish so it's a cheeky little nibble. The fungi becomes a bit inedible as it begins to develop into its stalk and phallus, or should I say, the fungus becomes inedible once it erects. <laughs> oh my God, get a life. Really and nice. it pops out easy enough if you cut the fungus properly. So, cheeky little nibble. But I do only speak for this particular fungi, phallus impudicus. I don't speak for all stink horns, although as far as I'm concerned, most stink horns are non-toxic. But you would probably pay like 500 quid for this in France. This is their kind of food. And the gelatinous layer is good lubrication for a bow drill to go in between your spindle and your bearing block. Just FYI. So, interesting fungus, right? 
I like having someone do all the work for me. That makes a nice change. Say hello to Madeline. That's my new crafting and food preparation table. It'll see some use today. How are we making fire today? Well, I have an abundance of char cloth. Look at that. I've got tinder for days. So we're gonna throw some sparks with the old steel. And what's that then? This is quartz. Flint and chur are a form of quartz. Their chemical composition is the same, silicon dioxide. Although I find quartz to throw much better sparks is a little bit more brittle but it's 10 times more aesthetic. So, no more flint, we've done up the game. We're on that pink shit now. But dig enough, you'll find quartz. I happened to chip the end of my shovel while digging a Dakota fire hole when it came into contact with this bastard. So an otherwise annoying consequence of digging turned out to be quite all right. But to be precise, this is rose quartz. Gets that pink hue from being developed in such ferrous or iron impregnated clay ground because there's so much iron in this ground. If I knew the first thing about blacksmithing, I would have a goddamn field day. But anyway, let's start throwing sparks. Let's put that in the fire! Right, now that's the easy part done. Look at them flames. Watching that back, I can dig that that wasn't a very elaborate, gallant and impressive shower of sparks. So let's ignite some char cloth using a more visually pleasing method. This yellow fungus is called Tremella mesenterica. Slow that down. Tremella mesenterica. Such a nice name, it just rolls off the tongue. But otherwise known as witch's butter, lovely name, or yellow jelly brain. Now, right off the bat, this gradient of yellow to white towards the substrate is a very typical feature of a similar yellow jelly fungus, Dacrymyces chrysopermus. But with Dacrymyces, the ridges are thicker. It's a fatter fungus, quite rare in this part of the world too. It certainly doesn't grow in such abundance like Tremella mesenterica does. But these little blobs of Tremella are everywhere at the moment, amongst all the deadfall and leaf litter. Dacrymyces also tends to be more orange rather than a pale yellow. But Tremella mesenterica colours do change and get washed out. But how does Tremella fare up medicinally? Those polysaturides that modulate the immune system, it's also an immunostimulatory, gives your immune system a bit of a kick up the arse if it's weakened or inhibited in any way. Much like Tremette Versicolor in that regard, so it's a good little clump of goo. It's on our side. Is it edible? Yes it is! Although it's not held in particularly high regard. It tastes like nothing, it just tastes like having frog spawn roll around in your mouth. It's the texture and consistency that puts a lot of people off. But Tremella mesenterica roughly translates to trembling intestine, but that's more of a description of a physical characteristic rather than a namesake for gastrointestinal upset, which wouldn't happen. This is a harmless fungi. But just because a fungus is edible raw, and I will stress this, emphasis, emphasis, just because a fungus is edible raw does not mean it's not contaminated by bacteria, fecal matter, or pathogens. So cook it in whatever you're cooking, if you're into that. What do you know about that burdock? From the genus of Arctium, let's talk about edibility and identification. So, identification. They are a biennial plant, meaning it will grow its root, leaves and foliage one year, then next year it will flower. The flowers will look much like thistles, so you may catch it in a different stage than I am currently. So I figured I'd mention that. 
might throw you off a bit if you're not familiar with the stages of development. And quite clearly they are an absolutely massive plant, they're very hard to miss. But what are some plants that share uncanny physical resemblances? Well, rhubarb for one, but it's not as common out in the wild. And have deeply red stalks as opposed to the predominantly green stem with some purple hue that comes with age on the burdock. The underside of the leaves are paler in colour in comparison to the top side of the leaf. Botanical descriptions of the leaf will say that it's woolly or furry. Those are characteristics that I wouldn't personally designate to this plant. They do have very fine hairs covering the underside of the leaf, but I wouldn't consider it woolly or furry. Not significantly so, it can be quite misleading. You can eat the stalks raw, although I have mentioned previously in other videos about not being able to digest cellulose. The same applies here. You can chew it, your enzymes will break down what they can, but you end up with a mass of undigestible cellulose. So, you know, either spit it out or just knock it back. Because cellulose does come in quite handy as roughage, you know, fibre for reasons. Cooking the stem makes them more palatable, but they're quite bitter. Cooking them makes them a bit less bitter, but it tends to leach the bitterness into the palate that you're cooking as a whole. The leaves are very bitter though. I wouldn't recommend those for a cheeky nibble. Plus the hairs are annoying when they get stuck in your throat. It's a <coughs> kind of deal. But the root is what we want. A specimen as large as this, its root can reach up to depths of 30 centimeters. So lots of digging is required, but we only want a small specimen. So let's crack on. Oh, okay. Dirty girl hands. Right, can I just pull this, do you reckon? No, 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 no. It goes in it. so deep into the ground. Brings a tear to my eye. <laughs> Seeing you get your hands dirty. She don't give no fucks. <laughs> I don't like the worms much. <laughs> You're just going to sit and watch me do it. I'll take over if you want. That's no, alright. <laughs> I just feel it'll be a very rewarding experience if you do all the work. Something you can tell the grandkids, you know? Yeah, wait, let me just... I dug up a burdock root once. Is that going to be my... <laughs> <laughs> my greatest tale of adventure, digging That's up right. a burdock. Ah! Ah! It's a centipede, you don't like centipedes. Uh. <laughs> no, don't you dare, Alfie! <laughs> That's dinner though! What do you know about them tits? You should take off your jacket so I can see your muscles flex <sighs> while you're at it. <laughs> Who's sexually harassing who now? I'll spy me some root. It snaps in half. <gasps> oh my god! <laughs> but that's good. That's a good bit. But there's still ways to go yet. Yeah? It wasn't the miraculous pull no, the whole fucking wasn't. lot. <laughs> it wasn't. I have super glue up here. Because I was trying to glue the fungus together, you know, the M and the heart. Oh! But it turns out fungus doesn't want to super glue to another fungus. Oh, okay. Who'd have thought? Is that why it's got these little tiny nails in it? Oh, that was for a separate video, finding north of a needle. I've left the truce. It's not a needle. Is it, you're saying that ain't a needle? It's a pin. It's a fucking needle. It's a pin, it's got a head. Alright, so it ain't a sewing needle. Wait, it's, it's, a it's a needle! It's it, got you're a just being head. semantic. You don't know shit. Alright, find north of a pin. Better. No, but there are. No, it came from a fucking sewing kit. Yeah, sewing kits have pins in them. You're just hard work. Should call things by their proper name, Alfie. So you should call a scone a scone then. Say it how it's spelt. No. You don't like celery? Do you like celery? How can you not like it? It just tastes like water. Celery's good. People bitch about it so much though. So, we got some chopped up burdock root, some burdock stem, some Tremella mesenterica, and a bit of Tremella aurantia. Both edible. So what we need to do is parboil the lot in a separate cup, just to remove the contaminants and clean it. Figured I'd throw some nettles in there too. Because why not, eh? Let's get cooking. Nice shot. You should do some voice acting. Say that, oh my god, that's such a big fire, Alfie. Uh, Go on, say that. Uh, Tremella's in, in goes the rest. 
And now we just leave that to boil. Whoa. <laughs> it's like a Venus flytrap. <laughs> does it like a clam though, doesn't it? It does, yeah. <laughs> Don't that look well pretty? Mm. Okay. No need to cry about it though. <laughs> <So beautiful. laughs> Careful! You just threw that fiery log at your bag made of fabric. Oh, Maddie! Right, hang on, let's just get this on camera for the record. Come closer. Right. Repeat what you just said. Oh, okay. So put your steel mug on the top of that. Right. And then use a stick to turn that upside down into the steel mug. And, you... and the mug is cool, so you're able to get that mug off. Oh, well, you're saying flip. Flip the contents of that into that. How am I supposed to flip the cup? That with a stick. It's only resting on it. Well, you're saying flip the mesh? Yeah. You flap your wings, baby. Don't think, just do. Or we could just let it cool down like sensible people. Oh, that's long. That's not long. Five minutes. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious! It looks like it worked. Good job, Maddie. There's one on your shoulders. There you go, baby. Look at that. I'll be damned. Aren't I a clever bitch? Now we cook it for real. Hooray! Isn't that just the most appetizing thing you've ever seen? <laughs> There's, there's the crown jewel though, that yellow jelly brain. Chow down on natural melon. Too slimy for me to like get it on the fork. You can't really taste it, it just kind of like slides around your mouth. Oh. It's just like slime. Slime and noodles. It mixes in with the noodles, but it is noticeably slimy, but it has no taste. Okay. I've been a bit of a worse, actually. It is quite a weird texture. It's okay if you spit it out. That's quite unpleasant. What did you think of the tremella, Maddie? Speak up, bitch. It was horrible. Horrible. I wouldn't recommend well, I it. thought it was alright. It's more the texture and consistency rather than the taste. What did you think of the burdock root? It was okay. It was okay. Yeah. The stem. No, was... that was horrible. Mm. It was. It wasn't bitter. It was just. It made everything else taste better, though. I guess you're right. Mm. It did make everything taste a bit bitter. The root was good, though. What else did we put in there? We put in some nettles. Oh, well, that, yeah. just, that just tastes like spinach. Don't think you got a piece of nettle there. No, I didn't get a piece of nettle. Oh, baby. Well, anyway, good game. How glorious is that, Maddie? It's, it's 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. That's how we do! <laughs> so, so much smoke in my eyes. Majestic as fuck. That's like the city of degenerates. It's all fresh blood. Oi oi, oi. what's all this about then? I imagine many folks have come across these orange balls on dead fallen tree stumps. It's perplexing. Is it a fungus or is it an insect egg? It's neither of those things. This is called Lycogala epidendrum, otherwise known as wolf's milk, which is quite peculiar. Wolf's milk is a literal translation of Lycogala. Lyco is from the Greek word lykos, meaning wolf, or relating to wolves or werewolves. Gala is the Greek word for milk, from which the word galaxy comes from. Just FYI, Milky Way, you see? Our galaxy was actually called the Milky Way because legend has it! There was this whole breastfeeding incident involving Hercules and Zeus's wife Hera, which, long story short, ended up in breast milk being squirted out all over the place which became the galaxy, henceforth known as the Milky Way. <laughs> anyway, epidendrum, epi means upon, dendron means tree, epidendrum growing upon trees. So, wolf's milk growing upon trees. Why the fuck it's called wolf's milk though, I have no idea. I imagine it has origins in 
mythology but maybe someone that's milked a wolf can fill me in on what I'm missing that'd be great but anyway what is it is the question you may be screaming at the screen this is a slime mold a plasmodial slime mold much like Falugo septisa and enteridium lycopodon it starts off as little individual amoeboids that from a distance looks a bit like red stains on trees they move across the tree as individuals engulfing and feeding on bacteria then once they're done with that they emit a pulse of pheromones if you will a chemical signal that serves to bring all the individual amoeboids together to form a plump congregation aka this shit the technical term is actually a failure another name for fruiting body but once in this stage they begin reproduction this orange oozing goo is what will become the slime mold spores once it dries out and the outer shell darkens in color and eventually disintegrates interesting stuff does it have any uses not really another name it goes by is toothpaste slime mold which is peculiar I don't imagine you could use this as a toothpaste substitute but it's not toxic but again contamination from bacteria on the substrate chemical compounds um, 1-dimethyl pyro-oledicarboxylate shorthand is called a lycogarubin has shown inhibitory and destructive effects against the HSV virus which is the herpes virus hooray HSV1 to be precise which is responsible for cold sores so you know there's one use negligible uh, like a galenocides show inhibitory effects against G posi bacteria gram positive bacteria we're on those slang terms now you know same old story with slime molds throw them in the stew pot although it does make everything taste a bit like play-doh brings back those nostalgic childhood memories of eating play-doh don't judge Speaking of slime moulds, here's another bit of Falugo septisa. The spores have not yet been produced. It's not ready for dispersal. A dead shrew. Hmm. How unfortunate. They're cute little things. I want one as a pet. Are you looking for your brother? I've got some bad news, mate. <laughs> Just putting this out there. I didn't kill the shrew. He was already dead when I arrived. Made me sad. Why isn't he intimidated by my presence? I'm Indiana Jones. Don't worry, little fella. You're too cute to throw in the stew pot. But I want to push my luck and get closer. I want some Dave Attenborough type shit. National Geographic. Oh, he's gone. He's pegged it, mate. You may have seen this flower before, popping up amongst all the thistles and opium poppies. Get high as fuck on that morphine and codeine. But this cheeky little flower is called a mallow. The genus is Malva. The species is Moschata. So it's the musk mallow, Malva moschata, identifiable characteristics. They have quite an uncommon leaf structure, not your typical broadleaf plant. The leaves look a bit like chamomile leaves, just little branchy divisions. So very distinguishable, at least for musk mallows anyway. Other species of mallow have regular leaves, but the flower, the seeds, the leaves, all edible. The stem is edible, but you'll soon learn that the stems are quite undesirable parts of plants. The root is not worth the trouble of digging out and not generally sought after. But I will say, if you do decide to chow down on the leaf, if you eat too much, you'll generally get that <coughs> feeling in your throat because there are hairs on the leaf. But a cheeky little nibble. There is a lot of musk mallow in this meadow. Food for days. It's probably like 70 calories if you pick all the petals. That is not dinner. That looks intimidating. Well, ain't that a purdy little thing? It's more so the camera focus that makes it look more enchanting. Where's Sean when you need him? He'd identify this. Well, would you look at that ant colony? Sorry, fellas. It's nothing personal. Look at all that protein! If you're concerned about keeping your games out in the sticks, protein fix right here. Lay a tarp out in the sun, fold one corner into the centre, and the ants will instinctively carry all their eggs into the shade under the folded side of the tarp. They do all the work for you. Oh, hello there, matey boy. Just look at that red soil. That red tint from all the iron oxide, if the camera picks it up. That is pretty red. That's bad times pretty much a no compass zone. Just an idea of how much iron or ferromagnetic material is in this soil. Here's a compass reading above ground. 
that I will say it is 15 degrees off where north should be but as we head down to the ground shit goes crazy dead magnetic fields what do you know about them? could potentially screw up the polarity of my compass needle unalign all the magnetic domains of the needle that would be bad times but I'm basically standing on one big magnet or several stumbled across an awful lot of punk wood which would be fantastic if I actually used it but for those of you that don't know what punk wood looks like maybe that's some terminology that no one's given you an explanation for yet basically it's just rotten decayed wood that breaks apart in your hand makes excellent char and if you're lucky enough if you catch it dry enough you can ignite it with a ferrocerium rod using the bathe it in sparks method so I was in the midst of processing up some fond fermentarius getting some real nice thin strips for easy peasy fire starting in the future figured you know what bitches love fungi and I love my bitches so one bitch in particular is very deserving of recognition and a token of gratitude so the plan is right here's the deal this is a basic crude heart shape I'll refine it further then carve out another heart shaped mould in the centre then I'll melt up some amber pour the amber into the mould then nap a piece of quartz into a heart shape whack that in the centre of the amber bam I think that would be pretty nifty a nice little souvenir so I broke off a piece of my quartz that I used for fire starting and just spent about half an hour or so napping it down into this heart shape that was a hard life it was pretty much a jagged square beforehand and considering I'm using a goddamn kebab skewer to do my napping that, that's not the best tool for the job but it will suffice so now I wanna nap this into a more refined heart so it can be plugged into the resin mould I find this harder than napping actual real arrowheads out of flint the symmetry of hearts man I'm so bad at making them symmetrical it's like large hadron collider schematics for me when I hold this up against the sun don't you think that looks like a skull or some demonic image well it kind of looks like a retarded goat with googly eyes you know can you see that maybe it's just me first boo-boo of the day that's bad times you probably saw it coming by the way I was napping it's a very amateur way to do it I saw it coming but hey let's crack on well we started off about an hour ago with pretty much just a raw block of quartz and I think I've done well to refine it down to this shape but it is just deceptively difficult to nap this top bit off I can't just blunt force trauma it because I risk fracturing it in a way I don't want oh it's hard life today man I think it's just a matter of chipping at it nanometer by nanometer molecule by molecule Now we start rounding out them edges. This is the tedious part. It's where everything goes uneven.
hollowing out some cavities. This seems to be the easy part, hollowing out the cavity. The problem is getting this side symmetrical with this side. It's going to be a pain in the ass cutting maybe four millimeters of fibrous material that doesn't want to break apart so easily. So what I'll do is I'll finish this at home, refine it, perfect it, get it done. But right now I'm just going to have a trial run. I'm going to melt up the amber, I'm going to pour it in, I'm going to see what it looks like nearly completed. So let's do that. It's going to take me another hour or so to nap the quartz alone. That's a project and a half mate. Because it's really awkward. You can see it's like, it's not your nibble at the edges type of napping project. Got to break off chunks without fracturing it. But anyway. So, there's beta testing. The Fon Fermentaris kind of subdues the colour of the amber. It should be that colour. At least we know it works. So, we'll perfect this at a later date. Or maybe this is it. Maybe there's perfection in the imperfection. It's very rough and rugged. Much like the style and method in which it was created and the environment it was created in. Hmm. It's a bit rough around the edges. It doesn't give a fuck. Just like me. It's perfect. This could do. This could do. Would also save me a lot of work. We'll see. And I feel that's a good note to end the day on. So, I'll see you around, bros. Sup, home boys and home girls. Last week's subliminal flash was a collection of fungi whose names had been abbreviated. The goal was to leave a comment with the full unabbreviated names. And boy, a lot of people know their shit. First up was Amanfau, which is Amanita phalloidus, otherwise known as the Death Cap. Oh boy. But let's talk about why it earned the name the Death Cap. It is responsible for 90% of fungi related deaths. 90%. One cap is enough to kill a 100 kilogram male, or 250 pound male for the American bros. Half a cap is enough to kill a teenager or adult male of lesser proportions. Put that in perspective. When I've spoken previously about certain plants or fungi being toxic, they really ain't shit compared to the death cap. A lot of the toxic things that I've spoken about will only either give you an upset stomach or if you overdo it, you'll probably violently shit yourself or ferociously vomit. But the death cap will straight up kill you, slowly and painfully, over the course of a week. So let's talk about how it kills you. <laughs> Ending on a happy note. First of all, after eating the fungi, you'll feel fine. There are no immediate symptoms whatsoever. You carry on as usual with the daily chores of the outdoors. You go to bed that night, everything seems hunky-dory. But then, after one or two days, shit starts getting real. You'll start to experience relentless stomach cramps, which feels like you've been eviscerated by a pissed off Persian with a rusty scimitar. Then, he reaches into your stomach and begins twisting out your intestines. You will violently shit yourself, you will vomit, as a result, you'll probably experience dehydration on top of that, as if you didn't have enough to worry about. Yeah, it will reduce you to laying on the floor, screaming in pain, assuming the fetal position and begging for mercy. But no mercy shall be given. It's only just started to give you a bad day. All of those symptoms eventually subside after a day or two. The gut-wrenching cramps ease up, the nausea stops. You think, by God, I must be really lucky. Everything seems fine. I'm saved. But this is a false sense of security, because now the death cap goes to work. On the 4th to 6th day, the aminotin mycotoxin starts to shut down your organs, your liver and kidneys in particular. Over the next few days, you'll probably experience total and utter kidney failure, acute liver failure, a hepatic coma as a result of liver failure, eventual respiratory failure, possible cardiac arrest, and eventual death. Fun times, right? <laughs> The only way to survive eating a death cap is to immediately get a liver transplant, which you know isn't available at the best of times and not particularly accessible when you're out in the middle of nowhere. 
But if you can get yourself to a hospital within a couple of days of eating one, then you might survive. Bad times in general though. So yeah, it is very deserving of the name the death cap. Well earned. But if there is one thing I would like you to take away from this video, it would be being able to recognise the death cap. This is just one image in one stage of development. Take the time to Google it, familiarise yourself with all its stages of development and identifiable characteristics, and do that for all the Amanita family of fungi too. Because we do indeed get death caps and destroying angels in the UK for my fellow Brits. They're not as rare as you may think, they sneak up on you man. Regardless of how familiar I am with them, it still makes me stop dead in my tracks once I stumble across one, and it makes me panic a bit. It's pretty much staring death in the face. Makes my heart race like a motherfucker, but anyway moving on. Next up is Aman Musk which is Amanita muscaria, otherwise known as the flyagaric, or flyagaric. Either is an acceptable pronunciation. I prefer agaric though. It's the comparatively much less toxic sibling of Amanita phylloidus, and a fungi that we should all be pretty familiar with because it's popularised in children's books and stuff. Gnomes apparently chill on them and use them as stools to sit on while fishing. Considerably less toxic than Amanita phylloidus. Also has different mycotoxins. The toxic compounds in this fungi are muscarin, ibotenic acid and muscimol. But it is believed that it would take about 10 to 15 caps to give you a fatal dose of poison. So it's not at all nearly as toxic as Amanita phylloidus, but still a bit toxic nonetheless. It is more of a psychedelic mushroom rather than a fuck you up kind of fungi. The chemical responsible for the psychoactive effects is called muscimol. Some people, and by some people I mean silly billies, eat dried specimens to trip balls. And to that I say, just stick with shrooms man. What do you know about them Liberty Caps? There's no need to eat poisonous mushrooms, man. Even if you are interested in aligning all your chakras and astral projecting to the Pleiades star cluster and chilling with the Palladians or whatever. Not that I would know. Then we have good old Daycon, which is Daedalaeopsis confragosa, the blushing bracket. They come in a wide variety of colours, pretty much the highlighted section of that colour chart. When they're orangey and growing on birch trees, they're sometimes mistaken for pip bet, which is Piptoporus betulinus, otherwise known as the birch polypore or razor strop. Pro tip, it doesn't sharpen knives, it strops knives. Sharpening and stropping are two very different things that produce two very different results. If your knife edge is blunt as fuck, then it will still be blunt as fuck no matter how much you scrape it against a birch polypore. All stropping does is realign bent or skewered pieces of metal on the knife's edge. It doesn't remove any material whatsoever, so no sharpening. Bit of a common misunderstanding. Dalcon was Daldinia concentrisa, otherwise known as cramp balls or King Alfred's cakes. Bit of historical lore behind that name. By now, I imagine everyone's familiar with what they're used for. So moving on to F FOM, which is good old FOM fermentarius, the horse's hoof fungi. Tinder for days. And finally, there was Traversi, which is good old Tremete versicolor, arguably one of the most pretty and aesthetic fungi out there. They can be pretty much any colour on the colour spectrum, with the exception of purples, or so I believe. I've never seen a purple one, but they are majestic as hell and taste like mushroom flavoured chewing gum, if you boil them. Pretty nice, a cheeky nibble. So shout out to all you sexy bitches! First up, JD Wayne's 1980, as he was the first person to identify them all, within 30 minutes of the video being uploaded I believe. That's pretty next level, you know your shit, it does seem. As you also contributed to the last Campostatic Subliminal Fungi Challenge, with the macro lepiotas and chlorophyllums, got my eye on you son! It's clearly no challenge for you. Matthias Bengston, third time in a row. On point like a needle, son. Spot on. 100% perfect. Brings a tear to my eye. Even went through all the trouble of including the Swedish names for those fungi. Which I won't humiliate myself trying to pronounce, but top bloke. And Essex Bushcraft and Survival, sup Georgie bro. And shout out to the Bushcraft dude, Connor Smith. How to make a Wookiee Rage, interesting name. Ryan Doherty, I can never say that name right, Doherty, uh, Roland Smith, High Voltage X11, Finn Hemsworth, Neutrino, Farkasmate14 and J Stan. Next level fellas. Last week's subliminal, or at least the result of it, was the Macro Lepiota, 
I included the slight misidentifications, but I missed out on another batch of answers, which was Tulastoma bromale, otherwise known as a stork ball, but to be more specific, the winter stork ball. Such a good answer, I have no idea why I missed it. Sorry bros, I hope you can forgive my negligence, so shout out to all you fellas. Living survival, outdoors and dips, Max Bow, RJ Doria and Charles Joseph. You bunch of hipsters with your obscure answers. And finally, shout out to Mark Ness, the bearded bastard. Hands Worst, fellow rocker of the Wii Sports Sparrow. Shout out to you, homeboy. Hayden Radford and the Zane Hill for unrelated reasons. Clint Hardwood, you can go suck a dick, mate. So, farewell, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you all have a nice weekend. Peace!